I already know that, man. I, lo I love Nip, man. I don't know. You, I, don't, I think you know we were getting ready to do a movie together right before he died. Um, called Thirty Eight. Spent a lot of time with him, man. Just a just a just a good dude, man. But I will tell you this, Jamal. I'm happy you're doing okay, man. I know you had a little bit of a health thing. I want to tell you I love you, man. But more importantly, I want to also tell you, man. I, I try to say this every time I see you. We appreciate you, man. We appreciate you for 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 everything that you do for black journalists and for black critics. And uh, I'm a big fan of you, man. And obviously, you know, I, I spent I don't talk to everybody because everybody don't get it. But I do know I have watched you interview me when with one one microphone pointed my direction. You was the only person like, what's up with this dude? <laughs> you know what I mean? So as 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 time goes by now and, and things happen, I just want to tell you, man, I really appreciate you for being there day one yeah. uh, with me and, and and my family and my wife and with Kat at the, you know, at the uh, 1901 BET Awards or whatever year you said it was. I, I appreciate you, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we got cat all the way in. Cat, you 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 good over there on the text? Oh, his thing, his his phone. Some it'd be like flickering sometimes. No, that's a lie. I haven't said nothing. Come on, his phone be flickering. <laughs> the good people at Apple not gonna like that for me. <laughs> Your thing is freezing, cat. No, I ain't said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That that's not me freezing. That's me frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I concur. I'm saying it's not many black journalists out there. Period. So he hit the fact that he's exceptional and is known is is a big deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was just concurring with everything he said about him. Well, yeah. I, I black tree to... does good work. Oh, appreciate that. So ho hopefully all that froze. No, no, we heard it. it. Didn't freeze. Your pictures froze, but we we. Well, we're saying good stuff. There you go. Now, now you're moving around. I, but I want to start on. I want to start first. Person yeah, I was words, Dion and Cat. But I want to start on on you, Dion, because I mean, I, I do feel like it's more than just this business relationship. I've I've been out to meet your family, your dog. I've been in your backyard. Everything you know. So I feel I got a personal connection to you. And I, and I usually don't talk about relationships. It's kind of like my black tree thing. I stay out of the bed, people's bedroom or whatever. But I got to know for you, like, how important is it, like, this whole journey for you to have somebody so uh, capable and accomplished in what she do in Roxanne as your partner? I mean, I don't, I, you know what, man? I don't even have the words for that. You know, um, you know, I've always been around strong black women. My mom was a single mom. And, um, you know, she, she, you know, my mom then fought with me in the park. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like after basketball games, you know what I mean? So, so being able to find someone like Roxanne that reminds me a lot in terms of the energy of my mom being, holding me down, fighting with me daily. And, you know, we've been in this business for a long time together, you know, so there's been very, there's been a lot of moments, man, where this town and this business that we're in has kicked me to the ground, you know what I mean? And we're like, yo, I don't understand, like, what we need to do to find success or why can't we get a phone call or, and she's been there to hold me down the whole time, man, so you know, I think that sometimes, man, every now and again, man, God puts certain people in your life that's meant to be there, you know, and, and they're meant to help you and fight with you and stand with you and help you get through things. And sometimes those people are seasonal. But every now and again, man, you are extremely blessed to have someone that can stand next to you for life. And uh, Roxanne has represented that. And um, I'll tell you one thing. I'm just happy. I'm happy for her now that that people are discovering her as a producer, you're talking about, you know, a small black independent production company that has a hundred million dollars in box office receipts. And, and people still like, Oh yeah, she, I said, no, she produced every movie I've ever done. You know what I mean? So it's just great to have someone like that. And, um, 
you know, even fading into, into the house next door, Cat, you know, Cat has picked up a part in my life as well. You know what I mean? Where you're like, damn, man, like every, like I said, every now and again, you get to meet somebody real. And this is a very, very tough business. And, and believe it or not, Jamal, 99% of the people you meet are wearing masks. So it's, it's, it's very rare to meet someone that does not have a mask on. You know what I mean? So right. I think, you know, Roxanne has been someone that I know does not wear a mask whatsoever. And then being able to see Cat and know who he is truly, like his heart, his soul, what he's about. And, you know, we have to protect people like that. We have to protect people like me that, that have integrity and, and heart and energy and love in them. You know what I mean? Because it's a cruel place. But yeah, we've been definitely blessed, man, to have Roxanne and, you know, and now even with this film, having Cat. I think we just lost Cat for a second, but um, let me let me ask you about it, about that, because Meet the Blacks won, you got Paul Mooney, the late, great Paul Mooney, the late, you got the late, great Charlie Murphy, and now you have, you know, and, and this Meet the Blacks too, and House Next Door, you have Cat Williams. Can you talk about Cat as a talent, what he's meant to uh, just the comedy genre, and also as, as, you know, comedians on film, what he's added to that whole genre, because I know he has a a roster of films now that he's done. I'm not talking about you like you're not here now, Cat. You back? But can you talk about <laughs> Cat as a um, as a as just a talent and what he brings and filling that void that you know Paul and Charlie Charlie leaving on that film? Yeah, man, it's funny, man, because when I think about part one and look back at part one, I do. That's probably the heaviest thing for me. Is is obviously you know Charlie Murphy. Charlie was a friend of mine, man, but. Um, Charlie was like very instrumental in calling people for me. Charlie called Mike Tyson. You know what I mean? Mike, come on down here. Like I remember watching him on the phone. You know what I mean? He was like, here, talk to this nigga, tell him. And I'm like, yo, this is crazy. <laughs> but he was just, and the only reason that Charlie didn't have a bigger role is because his schedule was crazy. He was trying to move stuff around. You know what I mean? But yeah, I missed him, man. And, and Paul Mooney was great. But yeah, when I look at the whole franchise now and I understand how blessed I was to be able to make that first little movie that we really understood and now have a second one with the giant like cat, you know what I mean? It just, it just makes you go like, wow, man, like it's just special. Like even now when I look at the trailer, I'm like, damn, that's cat. You know what I mean? Like that's cat flying off the roof of a house and you just go like, and then I read the comments. And I read people going, my favorite comedian, top, legendary, goats, you know what I mean? All across, and you go like, wow, you really have to just take a moment, man. So, so many times, Jamal, we're so in a hurry to get to the next thing or pat ourselves on the back that we don't never just breathe. And this movie is important for me because I want to breathe on this one. I want to watch it. I don't care about no box office. I made this movie for the culture. It's going to win. It's going to keep winning for a very long time. But, you know, even the, uh, the, the, the premiere, man, I'll tell you, I just told Roxanne today, I said, look, we're going to sit down and watch the movie at the premiere, and we're going to walk the carpet, and we're going to slow down. It's gonna, we just going to enjoy this because life, life stopped for a year and a half. You know what I mean? So all of the things that we're getting able to being able to do right now, man, we understand, man, we 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 could have not been here. When you think about George Floyd, when you think about COVID, when you think about, you know, people storming the Capitol, when you think about diseases, just like, man, like at some point, you just got to be like, thank you, Jesus, for being here. Thank you, God, for allowing us to have this great product. And more importantly, thank you, God, for allowing us to be able to work with Kat and Mike, and be able to get a culture movie on June 11th. So that's kind of my, my feeling on that. Okay, can I talk to you about a little about the start of your career? Because I know you grew, you grew up uh, in Ohio, were born in Ohio. Um, you've done something that I haven't heard of many Black people doing, emancipating themselves from their, their parents and doing this whole whole thing. And I'm guessing that you started at a young age, like hustling and doing your thing. Like, what do you attribute your your comedy style to? Does it come from 
doing it on the street? Does it come from just like, I mean, do you, do you have anything that you attribute your style to a little bit of where you, how you deliver your comedy? You're on mute, cat. That'd be happy. Yeah, no, I hadn't said anything important. Sorry. When, if somebody on this device says too many nice things about me, it just shuts off. And so Dion, <laughs> way over the limit of uh, uh, acceptable smoke on my device. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, the, the thing that kind of separates me is um, I, I'm not my biggest fan comedically. Um, I didn't come into comedy like that. Um, I, I came in loving to laugh and being an avid consumer of all things that I could get my hands on comedically. And it didn't matter to me if it was Monty Python or Moms Mabley or whatever um, piece of genre that it fit, if it was comedic, it, I enjoyed it. Um, then later on in life, I was blessed to be able to explore it as a money-making career type of option, but my love of it was already established. And so it changed how I desired to present it. Um, all of the comedic greats before me already were famous by the time I started, it was going is there anything that I can do in this short period of time that can get me into the hall with these greats? Um, but I had gotten such great examples because I had read everybody's autobiography and studied their story. And I, I was that guy reading the books about the people in the industry in the 20s and the 30s. So I... Um, I had a grasp on the medium before I understood that I would have it. So that was helpful. And um, public speaking was in my background. I was speaking to 10,000 people when I was seven years old in a shirt and tie. Um, it's just the life experience. I had already been out of the country doing missionary work by the time I was 16. I had already been to Marine Corps boot camp. Like, it's just a lot of different experiences. But in our field as a, a comedian, especially a stand up, it's about your life story and your experiences. And we know now that the more experiences you have in life, the better equipped you are, the better you get a better idea of how things go. And so it's been a joy to be in a, in a place of work that champions that. Um, I, I'm only funnier because I'm around people. I'm in all of the hoods or across America seeing funny people and hearing funny conversations. So um, I'm just a representative of my core demographic as we all are. Um, it just saves you from having to cross over if you're already in the promised land. So. I, I wanted like, I, I spoke earlier about all the interviews we've done. I mean, we perfect holiday, first Sunday, BET awards, but one of the most controversial and most viewed interviews that I have was yeah. a 2013 interview with me when we talk about the Illuminati. And I wonder like, did you get any blowback for like talking about, because everybody loves yeah. to repost that thing. Like it gets reposted and stolen from my YouTube channel more than any other video. But when Cat Williams talked about the Illuminati, Dion, if you haven't seen it, you gotta see this interview. Like everybody loves this interview. Like how, how, how does that ever come up in conversation? Does any, anybody ever bring that up, that conversation we had? Um, yes, but not, not blowback because there, there's not the entity to deliver the blowback. Like there's no, there, there there's, um, there's no foothold on it. Um, and that's how they operate, um, best. But the thing that made that interview so, 
um, reaching to so many people was um, that half of it was me and half of it was you. And um, you made it possible for that conversation to take place. And I trusted you to have that conversation that generally is only had privately and whispered when it's held privately. But the fact that we were both in that discussion and having it is what um, made it solid. And um, yeah, like I, I, I give more respect from my enemies than I get from um, the people that are with me. Um, the enemy has no choice but to respect me. I'm informidable and I am a um, willing vessel um, of my God. So the, the enemy uh, give, puts all of the respect on my name to the point where when I walk in, the enemy wouldn't dare talk. Um, it's the people that love you that have a different perception of you and a different treatment of you but i've got nothing but positives from it um as i hope you would have as well i have you you always dropping jewels i know we running short on time but dion i gotta know how's next door coming out i mean people are starting to go back to the movies how soon do you think we're going to get back to that full capacity in the movie theaters and how much do you think the audience is now going to appreciate more today than they did a year and a half ago when it was just, we could go to a movie when we want to, like that experience of going to the movie theater and being able to sit with your, your, your friends and, and strangers and have a laugh at a movie like House Next Door. Well, you asking the wrong person that. Yeah, I'll, a I'll answer that. I'll answer <laughs> that. Yeah, so, so the whole thing is like, um, you know, as a fan, we, we've all, seen movies privately at our house and we've all also seen movies at the theater so now we're comfortable doing either but when somebody spends the big money to make it look good and sound good and feel good it has to be presented in the best form it's like saying it's like saying couldn't the lakers play the nets um at the little park down the street from here? Yeah, they could. It's got two goals. It's got everything it needs. It's got little bleachers. Yes, they could. But when you have uh, great content, you can then pick the venue that's appropriate for that content. Um, putting a, a, a subpar lackluster piece of film on a movie theater is not gonna make it a better movie. It's just gonna be bigger. Um, but um, things with explosions and intrigue and suspense and um, when a director has put um, Marvel type quality direction behind a project that's a comedy that deserves to be seen in its best light. And it's gonna be seen in those other lights anyway. Like it's gonna be on a streaming service. It's not a choice, but you certainly don't pick the lowest ring first if you're um, gotcha. Simone Biles. <laughs> got you, got you. And uh, I appreciate y'all time for sure. Can't wait to uh, check out the movie. And I know the audience can't wait to check out the movie. And uh, can't wait to see you guys again in person. Yeah, you're going to see us in person at the red carpet, man. And as always, for sure. this is Cat Williams, and thank you for tuning in to Black Tree. <laughs> They're going to be so disappointed you didn't ask me anything else about the Illuminati. <laughs> right, right. And let me, let me say my last piece, man. Go see The House Next Door. June 11th, starring Mike Epps, Cat Williams, Danny Trejo, Gary Owen, Michael Blackson, Little Duval, Zule Hino, Brisha Webb, Tyron Turner, the whole crew, man. Support the movie, support Black productions, support Black stars, and more importantly, man, support the culture. Hollywood wouldn't do it, so we did it, man. You know what it is, man. Come on, man. There we go. There we go. All right, y'all. Peace out. Appreciate your time.